Hi. Welcome to the second talk in uh, room one here. The uh, presentation uh, is Sandro Geiken from the University in Stuttgart. Um, the topic is the trust situation. Why data protection does not protect much anymore. The idea is that the laws or the idea of data protection is completely incapable of actually protecting the uh, self-awareness, the concept of the, from the psychological see, uh, view of data protection. So, hats off for him. Give him an applause. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Indeed, I want to um, put a little criticism on data protection because I think it's, uh, it's a bit of an ineffective tool when it comes to what is actually uh, there to protect or what I believe it should protect, uh, protect primarily. Uh, so what is that? What should it protect primarily? I, be I believe it's informational self-determination. I, I need to elaborate a little on that because it's, it's a very German concept. I'm not sure how, how the, uh, the English-speaking country, countries handle that. Um, we had the decision on the, in the so-called uh, Volkszählungsurteil where the um, constitutional judges said that uh, but there was a big uh, census thing going on in Germany and there was a lot of opposition to that so it finally came up to the Constitutional Court and then the Constitutional Court actually made a very wise, very smart decision. They said, well, we cannot do this census because um, if, if you do not, if, if the state authorities or some other authorities know something about you and you don't know what that is, then you might adjust your behavior just, in, uh, just to be on the safe side or um, to prevent some sort of consequences which you might fear, you know, that's, that's the basic idea of informational self-determination. You should have sufficient knowledge about who knows what about you, because if you don't, then you might adjust your behavior, and if you adjust your behavior preemptively to prevent some sort of um, probable consequences or whatever, then uh, you're manipulating yourself, and the, the, actually the authorities who surveil you are producing that kind of manipulation. So you're manipulating yourself in a specific way, in a way the authorities want you to manipulate. Um, and that, of course, is something which we cannot stand in a democracy, because a democracy consists of free people, and free people are certainly not people who manipulate themselves in, in, in the uh, first place. So um, informational self-determination is a very important thing. Uh, for democracy, and that's why it was a constitutional thing, a constitutional court ruling at that point. And um, as I already said, it's very fundamental for freedom, you know, and you can easily think of some institutions where we have uh, freedom, the term freedom institutionalized, we speak about the free press, free voting, free opinion, and of course all these things uh, cannot really count if, if you're in a system where you're already manipulating yourself because you're afraid of the state knowing something about you and where you have to fear repercussions. Take Russia, for instance, where people st are standing in the election uh, chambers and watching the people electing and make it where they make their cross, you know. Of course, when you're surveilled like that and when you know that the state wants a certain thing from you and if you don't make that cross there, then you're going to have to answer, answer question and fear repercussion, then the mere fact of somebody standing in the corner, of somebody surveilling you, robs you of your freedom, deprives you of your freedom, you know. And the same is with a free press. When you, have a free pr when you have a press where somebody's sitting there from the state watching what you're doing, and if, you, if you're probably doing some, writing something they don't like, they're gonna, you're going to have to answer some questions afterwards, then you're not free either. You know? So all these terms, free press, free vote, free opinion, a couple of freedoms we have actually, uh, become mere maculature and mere, mere, well, in Germany we say paper tigers, when you, as soon as you deprive the people working in there of their informational self-determination. So, informational self-determination really is a very fundamental thing for many notions we have of freedom and many notions which are very important for our societal and wider conception of freedom, right? I mean, this is really like, it's not like, like the way uh, American presidents talk about freedom, you know, freedom here, freedom there, freedom this, freedom that, but this is really the, the material basis of freedom, yeah? You, you feel free, you have to, to feel free, to be able to feel free, to behave free, to do things in a free way, you have to have your informational self-determination. So, we can see that it's a very important thing. Now the question, how is it enforced? Of course we know that authorities, state authorities, econ economy as well, I think economy is also a big evil to, 
uh, to be considered here. Uh, they have a lot of interest in surveillance, they have a lot of interest in our data and information in watching us, so they could be manipulating us, you know. I, I mean, there's a couple of examples, I will give some later on. But. So the question is, um, how can I afford that? How, how can I uh, enforce uh, informational self-determination when there are so many very powerful agents actually interested in my data? And there are two concepts. The first concept has been avoidance of surveillance, avoidance of data, right? We, we just say that was the very decision they made in the census in, back in 1983. They said, well, we're not going to have the census, and then if, you're, if, if, if no data are, uh, are produced anyway, if nobody knows anything about you, then you know for certain that nobody does, and then, then you can be freely, decide freely, and you don't have to fear any repercussions or anything. That's sort of the traditional thing. But um, as you all know from, the, from recent years, that's, that's not, uh, not an option anymore, right? Surveillance is everywhere, really everywhere. There's a lot of agents coming up with long lost oversight, who's doing what, who's interested in what, which technologies are at play and stuff like that. So uh, there's a really strong rise of large scale, highly efficient surveillance. And um, the, the particular the thing about that new kind of surveillance we're facing is, of course, in connection with this new paradigm of crime fighting, which is worldwide being followed by the police. I already mentioned that earlier. Uh, the police has changed its method of crime fighting, largely due, not due to 9-11, it was after 9-11, of course, but more due to the technical capacities they have now. Uh, they don't want to investigate crimes after they happen anymore, like they did in Tartort, right? I mean, the, the, the traditional Tartort commissar, then somebody murders some guy, and then he goes there and investigates all the, all the stuff and looks what happened and stuff. And um, that's no more the idea they're following. Actually, the, the Bundeskriminalamt in Germany has, has already devoted large parts of its, uh, of its power, manpower uh, to, to this other method of crime fighting, namely preventing crimes before they happen. Yeah, which is really sort of a strange idea. It's like minority report or something. You know? And you ask yourselves immediately, how can they do that? How can they prevent crimes before they happen? How can they make that an official paradigm, investing a lot of money, building a lot of organizational structures in which, in fact, the majority of the German police commissars at the Bundeskriminalamt are already working in? And the answer is, of course, well, surveillance, right? You have to identify groups of people which are suspicious or which could commit crimes, and that's uh, a thing of large-scale identificatory surveillance, which really scans everyone and then makes profiles, generates profiles, and identifies certain types of people to be uh, potential, potential suspects or suspicious. And then you have to watch them, observe them continuously, and see if they behave suspicious, uh, more suspicious than, than you already think they are, in order to sort them out before they do something bad. So. Um, that's what we're facing right now, and any idea of avoidance of surveillance seems gone, really. So uh, that's, that's something which we only meet in some uh, partial concepts, which are slowly developed now, like privacy-enhancing technologies, where we say we have to embed some privacy-enhancing stuff into the technology and so on to avoid certain data. But generally, the, the concept of avoidance of uh, surveillance is really gone. So um, how do we enforce informational self-determination, what's the new idea? Because we haven't given up on that, of course, not officially. So the new idea, which is followed for a while now, which we all know, is data protection, right? <clears throat> we came up with this idea of data protection, Datenschutz, also a very German thing in the beginnings, at least. And uh, what data protection does is to regulate the evaluation and use of data uh, which are generated in, within surveillance, and to that by laws, by laws and regulations, organizational structures and stuff. And that, again, is a very complex, complex thing to do. I mean, we, meanwhile, data protection has grown into a very complex canon of laws, of organizations, a lot of uh, intertwinglings there with the industry, and a lot of different positions you can assume there, so really it's been growing a big thing. Um, there are many exceptions, of course. The, that's something we, we, we are witnessing as well as soon as the, some certain particular surveillance measures come out of the press, like two or three years after it has been publicly debated, then the police slowly starts to, and the industry, they slowly start to get exceptions, exceptions, ex exceptions, and so they, they, they're always nagging on these things and um, making them vanish, sort of. Um, 
But in general, that's the idea of how we, how we can ma manage informational self-determination, right, by data protection, because we can't avoid it anymore, so we have to protect the way in which data are evaluated and use, used. Um, now the question is, how, how precisely does data protection want to, uh, want to produce informational self-determination? And then the idea, of course, is, well, data protection aims to provide the public with sufficient knowledge about which data are known where. Like, the, the idea is, princi in principle, if you want to be informationally self-determined, you can call those guys from data protection, and you can ask them, well, who knows what about me? And then you, you know that, you have the sufficient knowledge to decide, and then you can make informationally self-determined uh, decision again, decisions again, be informed. But the question now is whether data protection really does that. And that's the, the question which I want to pose here for my talk. And my hypothesis here is no, it's, it's unable to do that. And it's even unable to do that in principle. That's what I'm going to argue for now. And a few questions is, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give you the, the bottom, bottom line of what I'm aiming at before, so you have, you have sort of an idea what I'm going at. I think that um, really to, to, to be informationally self-determined or to have sufficient knowledge to decide freely and to decide informed, um, you would have to have a lot, of, a lot of stuff actually about data protection, about surveillance, and that's just utterly impossible. So data protection really lives on sort of some very hypothetical idea of how we could have sufficient knowledge about these situations. That's something I'm going to try to elaborate. So like like the, the knowledge of real people is not working like that, uh, the way data protection thinks it is. So, and to come to this notion, I just want to pr uh, follow a few questions. Like the first is, what is sufficient knowledge to decide freely and self-determine? And uh, how does decision making actually work psychologically? You know, what, what are the processes really which we, which we have to look at when we want to um, reassure people some, some sort of ability to decide freely and to decide based on knowledge? And then, of course, when we get that knowledge and that little insight, we can ask ourselves, does data protection actually provide sufficient knowledge in, in that particular sense? Okay, now it's going to be a bit theoretical. I'm a scientist, so sorry, I have to go to theory first. And uh, the theory I'm going to use now is decision theory. We're going to look first at some categorization from decision theory, because basically there are two kinds of knowledge-based decisions. The first one is the good kind, that's deciding with certainty, right? And that was something we had in, in the avoidance situation. I was knowing for certain that the state didn't have any information about me, so everything was definite, everything was known, and all the consequences could be foreseen much more clearly. The situation was not very complex, so I could decide with certainty in any sort of situation where surveillance might have been an issue, right? But that's not the case anymore, so now we have... Oh, that's bad. Uh, now we have the bad kind of, of uh, decision which we're facing. Of course, the majority of the decisions we're facing are always like that. We have to decide with uncertainty, right? Not everything is definite, not everything is known. The consequences cannot be entirely foreseen. And the situation is somewhat complex, so I'm not really able to cognitively think of all the factors and, and involve everything that would have to be involved to make a really deeply informed decision. Um, decision theory then varies some degrees and produces produce further types, decision under risk, indefinite decision, and so on. That's not so important. Um, but important is that this is a, 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 very, um, a very important kind of decision, because usually the decisions we make are, are always under some kind of uncertainty. We never know fully all the consequences, fully all the things we have to uh, know to, to judge in a certain situation. So um, that's the type, of course, I want to be looking at a bit more closely because that's the type which we'll be facing in our situation with data protection as well. So how do we calculate our odds for uncertain decision, right? We have to calculate something, look at uh, how, how we, uh, what's, what's the outcome of that option, what's the outcome of the other option, and then see and make a trade or find some, some way to decide that. Um, and what does decision theory say how that works? 